Well, nice to be back. I had Charles Stanley and another fellow uh, stand in for me for a couple of weeks there. Uh, they had interesting messages I thought were worthy of putting up here on my YouTube channel. But this week, now that I'm back, I was thinking about the times um, in my life, which was most of the time, really, when I let other people ride or push my emotional ferris wheel. I've talked about that a couple of times. Um, what I mean by that is that I used to let people influence what I would do. Before I would make a move, I'd think about, well, what would that person think about what I'm doing? What would that person say after I did what I did? Um, so every decision was made around the fact that someone else would influence my emotional well-being. And if they uh, approved of what I did or said or whatever it was, the this, this circumstances, then my emotional ferris wheel, which you see behind me, would ride to the top. And then if they thought, well, you know, that's kind of a loser statement there, John, my emotional ferris wheel would ride back down to the bottom and I'd be down in some valley of depression. Not really depression, but I'd feel badly based on what other people think about John Tyler. Well, some years ago, I have to pinpoint it down to December of 2007 when I asked the good Lord, show me your plan and purpose for my life. And in addition to that question, I asked, God to point out to me, you wrote this Bible, Lord, you wrote it for me, and you wrote it for other people out here in YouTube land, you wrote it for every human being on the planet. So I'm asking you to take the blinders off my eyes, let me understand exactly what it is that you're saying in your word, the Bible, because again, you wrote it to me, it's your personal letter to me, John, here's my owner's manual for life, Follow that, and then you won't have to let others ride your emotional Ferris wheel to the top, to the bottom, somewhere in the middle. Um, the reasons that people allow others to ride their emotional Ferris wheel to the top or to the bottom, instead of being nice and steady and stable, like I now am, uh, there are about 10 good reasons and they fit into the fear category of why we're afraid to make a decision or do something or step out there and take a little risk here and there. Uh, we're afraid to do anything because we're afraid of what others are going to think, say, or do based upon what we think, say, or do. So it's probably time to learn why we do it and then to sh I want to show you how you can avoid doing that so that you can be rock steady uh, like an anchor in the time of any storm. You can be steady, stable, and let other people ride their own Ferris wheels if they like, but you don't want them to control and make you uh, a victim, really, of uh, emotional Ferris wheel manipulation, if you will. So let's discover the 10 biggest fears that we have out there that cause us not to do uh, some things and not to say some things um, or not to think some things. It's crazy, but here's the 10 biggest fears that people have. And we'll start with the 10th and work our way to the top one, the biggest fear, number one fear that people have. The first one, the first fear that we have is losing our freedom. Um, that's a pretty big fear, and we, we're slowly losing it anyway, and I'll elaborate that in, on that in just a minute. Fear of the unknown, fear of things we cannot see, uh, kind of get to us. We make our decisions based on, uh-oh, I'm kind of afraid because I, I can't see what's ahead of me, so I don't know what to do, so I'm going to do nothing. And if I do something, somebody's going to say, think, or do something that's going to make my emotional Ferris wheel go to the top 
stay in the middle or drop to the bottom uh, of my emotions. Number eight, working our way down to number one. It's a fear of pain, uh, emotional pain or physical pain. Uh, the reason we're afraid of pain is uh, it sort of fits into the fear of the unknown because it's like the doctor tells you something, like he did my sister a little while ago. Um, she had uh, cancer on her face. Forget what they call it, melanoma or something like that, but a couple of spots. So her biggest fear was the unknown. Uh-oh, what am I going to do now? I have cancer, meaning, you know, when people say I have cancer, it's like, uh-oh, the world is coming to an end, I'm going to die soon. It's the fear of the unknown. Well, she went to a dermatologist and, and they removed some skin here and some skin on her nose and uh, said that they were going to uh, do a little cosmetic surgery on it coming up pretty soon. So her biggest fears were alleviated once she saw the doctors. But immediately what she thought was, my face is going to get ruined. And uh, what are people going to think? What are people going to say when they look at me? Rather than, I'm going to save my life. I'm going to go to the doctor and get this thing done before it gets any worse. So we do have a fear of pain, whether it's emotional. In her case, it was both physical and emotional and also unnecessary. And then number seven, what we're afraid of and why we allow people to ride our emotional ferris wheel up or down is a fear of disappointment. We hate to disappoint people, don't we? So when we go to say, do, or think something, we kind of analyze in our head, and we shouldn't, well, what are people going to think? What are they going to say? What are they going to do if I think, say, or do the following. So I don't want to disappoint them. I'm afraid to disappoint them, so I'm going to do nothing. I'm going to take the easy road out. I'm not going to do anything. And a lot of people just live their lives that way, doing nothing. I call them fence sitters um, because of, for obvious reasons, they're sitting on the fence not doing. You're not living when you're letting people ride your emotional Ferris wheel to the top or to the bottom or somewhere in between. There's a fear of being miserable uh, that gets to us, so we stop doing things. We're afraid we're going to be poor. We're going to enter into this poverty uh, realm that we keep hearing about. Ooh, the poverty levels in the United States are increasing. Uh-oh, that's going to happen to me next. What if I lose my job? I'm going to be poor. I don't want to be poor. So I have a, f a fear of misery. I have a fear of being poor, sure. I have a fear of going into a bad relationship. So I'm not going to enter that relationship. Why? Because I've been burned here, I've been burned there. Uh, whatever your reasons are, you're letting, you're doing nothing, sitting on that fence again, because you're afraid to take that step. Um, you're, you're living in fear. Let's face it. Uh, so. Fear of uh, bad relationships is another biggie. Uh, and that fits into fear of disappointment, fear of the unknown. They all kind of are interwoven into one big ball called fears. Another one is uh, fear of uh, loneliness. Now, even married people uh, have that feeling that they're alone. I went through that myself 18, 19, 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, I, I found myself sitting in the living room watching television, and my former wife was sitting on the sofa, and my son was in that room too, and they were chatting back and forth. And I felt like I was in some other world. You know, it was like, I'm here, there are people in the room, but I feel like I am totally isolated and by myself. They're having a chat, uh, and here I am, you know, just a, a sofa ornament. <laughs> so, but true or not, I let that get to me. And uh, so I let someone else ride my emotional Ferris wheel to the bottom, in that case. 
And I really felt badly for myself. Fear uh, of loneliness. And like I said, even married couples are sometimes lonely. If you're married or have been married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. How about a fear of ridicule? Wow, if I do this, somebody's going to ridicule me and laugh at me. Unfortunately, that fits into this salvation mode too. Well, you know, if I accept the Lord as my Savior, then I have to tell people about it, and they're going to ridicule me for doing that. Your own family will ridicule you, other people, your friends, your co-workers, and so you either don't take that step um, to trust the Lord as your Savior, or you take it, but then you keep everything hidden kind of under a, uh, a little cloak of secrecy. I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm just going to like live like they do. So, but you're robbing yourself of blessings that are unbelievable by just, um, as they say these days, coming out of the closet um, and tell people, hey, I'm a Christian and I don't really care if you like it or you don't. Accept me as I am or don't. That's up to you. But I'm not letting you ride my emotional Ferris wheel to the top or the bottom. I'm going to take a stand. I'm going to go and trust the Lord. I'm going to go seek the Lord's wisdom through His Word. I'm going to do things that are going to make my life better. So I'm going to get off this fence. I'm going to go do uh, what I know is right, and that is to inherit eternal life in heaven by accepting the Lord as my Savior, by asking Him for to forgive me of my sins. All of that's on the link called the Salvation Link right here on YouTube. So you can investigate that a little later if you desire to get out of this rut that you might be in of letting everyone around you prevent you from doing things that you really should be doing or want to be doing, but you're afraid. So fear of ridicule is right up there. That's like number four. Number three is fear of rejection by others. Well, if I do that, they're going to shun me, including that salvation thing that I was just talking about. They're going to not only ridicule me, but they're going to shun me. They're not going to hang around with me anymore, like I'm diseased or uh, something along those lines, like I, I'm a you know, uh, third wheel here, like I'm a bump on a log, like I'm a sofa ornament they're going to reject me. And it could be people in your own family, it could be friends, co-workers, as I say. And sometimes, as I said earlier, on other uh, fear motivations um, that prevent us from doing, thinking, or saying things, is uh, this fear of rejection will sometimes keep us from trusting the Lord as our Savior. So we're going to stay in this prison called fear for the rest of our lives. you got to break out of that prison. you got to get released out of that prison. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment. Now, number two, believe it or not, this should be number one, I would think, but number two is fear of death. Every one of us are afraid of dying. Almost every one of us. For those of us who do know the Lord as uh, our Lord and Savior, and who do know, based on the Bible now, if the Bible is true, then what it says in there, if you accept the Lord as your Savior, if you ask Him to forgive you of your sins, again, check out the link that we have here on YouTube. And if you do those things, then you are absolutely destined for heaven. So when you die, you really, your body dies. But remember, I've said this in so many lessons, that your spirit will live on forever, either in that lake of fire, eventually when you have to face God and He casts you into the lake of fire or in heaven. So when you die physically, you actually begin your eternal life. Actually, when you're born, you begin your eternal life. Your spirit does, because it's going to live somewhere, either in the lake of fire or in heaven. So when you die, for those who are who have accepted the Lord as their Savior, that's the first day of the rest of eternity. It's terrific. So there's, there's nothing to fear there. So, but number two is the fear of death. And I 
have told you before, but I've seen many people who are on their deathbed who are absolutely deathly afraid that when they open their eyes again and they know somehow internally that they're going to open their eyes again and face eternity, the unknown is which eternity am I going to face? Roaming around on this earth until the judgment day as a spirit or being absent from the body and present with the Lord like the Bible teaches, will I be there in heaven immediately upon death or will I be roaming around on this planet as a spirit until the great white throne judgment and then I'm going to get cast into the lake of fire. Unfortunately, part of the torment spoken of in the Bible is exactly that. If you die without the Lord as your Savior and your spirit spends eternity, not eternity, but until the great white throne judgment of God happens, if your spirit is spending that time here on the planet, roaming around, you already know what your destiny is. And to me, that's the torture of, like I've said so many times before, uh, when you get home and you know you've done something wrong and your mom says, wait till your father gets home, you know it's coming. And that's kind of worse than the punishment itself. And number one, believe it or not, is the fear of failure. If I do say or think this and I fail, oof, but that all fits into the Ferris wheel thing. That culminates all of the stuff that I've already mentioned. Fear of doing something and failing. I have to tell you that if I do 10 things and I fail at 8, I'm happy because I succeeded at 2. And that's how things get made. That's how technology gets uh, done. They have to fail first, then they hone in on, oh, well, wait a minute, if I change this little stupid thing, then that device that I'm thinking about will actually work. You see it advertised on TV so many times, and so do I, and I keep saying to myself, why didn't I think of that? It's so simple. Why didn't I think of that? I could have been a multi-billionaire. Somebody is, because they faced and did what they set out to do after they thought about doing something. They did it and they were successful. But I guarantee you, they didn't just do it and boom, it was all set. Oh, look at somebody picked up my, my uh, patent and uh, everything worked out hunky-dory and now I'm sitting there in a pile of cash. It didn't happen that way. They had to fail. So we have fear of failure. And that does really deserve the top spot on why we do or don't do things that allow people to ride, run our Ferris wheels to the top or to the bottom. Gotta have a little drink. Arizona iced tea this time. So now let's discover how to get rid of that emotional Ferris wheel syndrome that we're all uh, prone to uh, falling into that trap. And the other side of fear is freedom. Well, where does freedom come from? Freedom from what? How do we gain this freedom? Let me read to you why or what the world defines as freedom. They define freedom as life without any restraints whatsoever. Is that really freedom? It's when people say, I can say anything I want to say, I can do anything I want to do without anybody else telling me what to do. Well, we found out recently and that fits in losing our freedom, we found out recently that that's not true. Because if you say certain things to certain people in certain classes, and I can name about 10 different classes right now of, of people, if you say something that used to be freedom of speech, you can now either get fined, go to court, go to jail. You, you can't do it anymore. Um, losing your freedom. Can you drive an automobile without a license? No. The state, your state, has to give you a license so that you can go out and buy an automobile and drive the thing around legally. So, you, can you smoke anymore in a restaurant? No. Uh, not that smoking is good for you, it's not. 
But sometimes, now they, they you can't smoke at a subway stop out in the atmosphere. You can't. They're taking your freedoms away slowly but surely. They continue to want to take, uh, exercise this gun control situation. In my state of Massachusetts, they're trying now to just tighten everything up, which is good. I don't want mental patients out there running around getting a license to carry a gun because so many times we've read about and seen on our news that somebody that's a little bit way off uh, goes in and does a lot of uh, killing and shooting and so forth. In some cases, if you take all the guns away, they're going to stab them to death. So, it, or some other, run them over with an automobile. Whatever it is, if somebody's mentally deranged, they're going to, and they feel like they want to kill somebody. I think it was two little girls this week. Uh, they were getting into some kind of a little movie thing. And uh, the movie thing basically told them, you have to go kill somebody to be set free. Twelve-year-old girls. So they stabbed their friend almost to death uh, because of this little movie that they saw. Are they mentally stable? I don't think so. I mean, I was 11 and 12 years old. I never thought about stabbing my friends to death. Uh, anyway, I, I'm getting off the subject. Um, so freedom, we think, is living life without any restraints upon us whatsoever. And uh, it's just not true. The world tells us that we can just be totally selfish. The world teaches that we can be gods, little g, within ourself. So, uh, we rule. Whatever we feel is right, let's do that. The world tries to take anything to do with this Bible or God or the Lord J Jesus' name out of society so that you can be free to do anything that you want to do as long as it fits within their guidebook. Not God's guidebook, but their rule book. Um, yet the Bible says that the only way to freedom, true freedom, is through uh, the Lord Jesus. Let me read that to you in John 8.36 out of the NIV. Uh, it says this, so if the Son, that means Jesus, S-O-N, sets you free, you will be free indeed. Well, free to do what? Free to sin? Actually, yes, but you, if you choose to, to accept the Lord as your Savior, you actually, your conscience, the Holy Spirit that Jesus sends back to live within you, gets in there and as soon as you do something wrong now, you actually know and you feel really bad about it. And there is a, a way that you can just ask for forgiveness, even though Jesus died on the cross for all of your sins, past, present, and future. It says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess those sins that we just committed as a Christian, let's say, then he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins. Not to ask for forgiveness when we know we willfully uh, disobey God or commit sins, there are consequences, as I've said in so many messages. And the consequences of that, it's not a punishment really, it's a consequence. You'll suffer some other way. As I pointed out, smoking is not illegal, it's not against the Bible uh, necessarily, but if you do, then my brother died from throat cancer and all kinds of other cancers. My father died from uh, three heart attacks from smoking, four packages of Camel cigarettes unfiltered every day. So there are consequences of the way we live as a Christian once you accept the Lord as Savior. Um, real freedom is freedom from fear. The fear of guilt, worry, a fear of bitterness that you have against other people or they might have against you, fear of dying. All those fears that I mentioned that keep you from doing, thinking, or saying what you know to be right, but you're afraid, all those fears disappear. Why? Because when the Lord is in control, um, then all those fears disappear. At least they did in my world, so I have to only uh, point out to you what has happened in my own life. Another Bible verse, 1 John 4, 18, says this. Uh, 
You get rid of fears by letting God love you. John the Apostle teaches this in 1 John 4, uh, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Who is perfect love? God. God drives out fear. How? When you accept His Son as your Lord and Savior, your fears, uh, you have no fears. I mean, like I pointed out earlier, the biggest fear to me should have been death and the unknown and the future and eternity. That's a biggie. And you don't, you lose that fear. It's gone. And so the fear of retribution or by, if you say or do or think the wrong thing, somebody else is going to uh, come back and condemn you. They can't. They can, but that's their business, not yours. So you learn that you have somebody that's walking, that's Jesus, walking with you, walking beside you. Every day when you get up, you should be uh, rehearsing Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which says don't trust in uh, your own thinking, but instead let the Lord lead you and guide you and direct your paths for that day. That's the smart way to go. Then, if the Lord, if you ask the Lord to lead you, guide you, and direct you, and direct your footsteps for the day, you have, what, what is there to fear? Nothing. You, you're doing everything within His will. And when you get off that path, you already know, like I say, the Holy Spirit convicts you and tells you, uh uh, you know better. That's the guidance, that's the leadership. Lord, should I make this decision today? And then somehow, you make that decision because the Lord is there to guide you. And I've learned that I can't even make a bad decision because if I make a bad decision, the Lord is right there to get me out of that situation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us all about it, that no matter what you do, um, God, there, God gives you a way to escape from that. So even if you make a bad decision, there's a way that God makes so that he can close that door, open a new door, and let you walk right through it. Um, so John 8.36 again says, So if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. Um, once you accept the Lord as your Savior, by the way, His part of that freedom that you don't have, if you're not a follower of Christ, one is, we become God's son or daughter through that relationship with his son Jesus. We become, the Bible says, joint heirs with Jesus. Everything Jesus owns, we own. Everything in heaven that he owns, we own. So we become a son or daughter of the living God. We take Jesus' family name with us. We change our name from John Tyler, period, to John Tyler, Christian follower of Christ, Christ follower, whatever you want to call it, it's still Christian, so you're actually changing your name to Christ follower, which is great. We become more like Jesus when we accept him as Lord and Savior. That's the goal of God the Father. He says that uh, his desire is that we become more conformed to the image of his Son. We become somehow nicer people we respect others and we respect their feelings and we don't try to judge and we don't try to condemn and we don't try to make them feel badly about decisions they've made. So we become a little better person by not letting or causing them to ride their emotional Ferris wheel to the top or to the bottom. We inherit, we inherit privileges uh, when we become a Christ follower. Some of those privileges are uh, that we can tap into all of God's resources that He gives us in this life. Money, time, talent. When I say time, a lot of us waste it. We might be sitting at home watching Judge Judy all day, when in fact we could better use that time for other things that are kind of more productive. Not saying TV time is bad, I watch TV at night myself, but during the day I, I have to stay busy doing some, some things. So part of my prayer is, Lord, lead me, guide me, direct me this day. And generally speaking, he does, and he'll lead me off into some productive areas. Uh, we inherit, 
when we accept the Lord as Savior, we inherit eternity in heaven. Remember, and everything that that place has to offer us, we uh, inherit that. And the Bible says, where eyes have never seen or imagined uh, things of splendor and beauty, it's there. We inherit that. It's automatic. Uh, we have direct access to God. We can go to God directly in prayer. We don't have to go to a priest or a madam or a nun or a guru or a imam. We don't have to do any of that stuff. The Bible teaches that we have an advocate with the Father. Our advocate is Jesus. When you accept him as your Lord and Savior, he places his cloak, clothing of righteousness over you, so that you can go directly into uh, the throne room, if you will, of God, and say, Our Heavenly Father, and ask God to lead you, guide you, direct you, and take care of this problem or that problem, and he will. He'll do it. He's always done it with me. Now, here is proof that Jesus exchanged his sin, uh, your sin, on the cross when he died on the cross for your sins. He exchanged, he took your sins, put them on himself, and he put his cloak of righteousness, I call it, onto those of us who have accepted him as Lord and Savior. I don't think I've ever read this before, so here's something new for you. It's in Colossians 1, 20 through 22. I have to read it because it's really important. It says, and through Jesus, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. I'm reading out of the Bible. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. God can't look upon the sins of men. It also says, yet now God has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. He died for your sins and for my sins on that cross. And then it says, as a result, he has brought you into his own presence, God's own presence, he brings you into his own presence, and you are considered to be holy and blameless or righteous as you stand before him without a single fault. See, God says that I now see you and hear you through, it's really through this cloak of righteousness that my son Jesus gave to you if you asked him to be your Lord and Savior. That's how I know for a fact you can go right to God. You don't have to go through men on this planet. It makes no sense. It's not even scriptural. You go directly into God's throne room through his son's righteousness, which he gave to you when you accepted him as Lord and Savior. Now, the Old Testament of uh, book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18, says this, and it's important for me to finish with this, though your sins, our sins, be as scarlet, and I have to tell you what scarlet means because we all think it means red. Though your sins be as scarlet, in other words, the evil stuff over here, scarlet, whatever it is, oh, it's over here. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Isaiah was predicting this time when Jesus would come uh, forth, give his life in exchange for yours, die for your sins, give you his righteousness. All this would happen on the cross. And then your sins, though they be as scarlet, will be pure, white as snow. And as it said uh, early, as I said earlier, God says in his word, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him. Righteous, holy, blameless. He sees you without sin through his son, Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's define scarlet as I end this. <clears throat> I looked it up. It's amazing, the story behind scarlet. Scarlet means a worm. Crimson, which does mean red. A worm, the female, C-O-C-C-U-S-I-L-I-C-I-S, -I -I carcass illicis, I guess. B, scarlet stuff, crimson, scarlet. The dye, get this, the dye, the crimson color, 
uh, sort of red, blood red if you will, came from the dried body of the female of the worm Coccus illicis. The dye, the scarlet colored dye, came from the dried body of the female of the worm. It always goes off like that. Uh, now, it goes on to elaborate the story of that. Scarlet means worm, grub. The worm, carcass illicis, means this. When the female of the scarlet worm species was ready to give birth to her young, she would attach her body to the trunk of a tree, fixing herself so firmly and permanently that she would never leave that trunk of the tree again. The eggs deposited beneath her body were thus protected until the larvae were hatched and able to enter into their own life cycle. As the mother died, the crimson fluid stained her body and the surrounding wood on that tree. From the dead bodies of such female scarlet worms, the commercial scarlet dyes of antiquity were extracted. What a picture this gives of Christ dying on the tree so that you and I may live, and he gave up his blood on that tree called the cross. And uh, he did this so that he may bring many sons and daughters into glory. It's almost like that mother worm. It was a, it was a terrific picture to me of what the original meaning of the scarlet. Though your sins be as scarlet, as this carcass illicis worm mother who died to give birth to her children so that they might live, she died so that they might live and her blood stained body on that tree uh, is what Scarlet is all about. And it's such a picture of Christ dying on that cross so that you and I might live. It was just amazing. And it says that, by the way, in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, that story. So to me, that's an amazing correlation between the word Scarlet and how Jesus died on the cross for your sins and for mine. So being truly free means that we are totally and completely uh, forgiven of all of our sins and we are totally and completely dependent upon Jesus for everything. And I am absolutely uh, free, believe me. Uh, you should let him be your guide if you can. He'll bring you through the storms of life and the storms of life will come. But you don't have to worry about other people riding your emotional Ferris wheel. You just trust the Lord to get you through the storms, and He will. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's nothing that is not common to man by, whereby which we're tested or tried or proven, if you will, whereby God will not allow you an avenue of escape from whatever trial that is. So whatever trouble comes your way, you can rely on the Lord to get you through it. There's, so all your fear is what I'm trying to tell you in this message, goes away through Christ. Any other way, I don't know how people live um, when they have to face fear alone. You don't have to. If the Son of God is walking with you, there is nothing on this planet that will cause fear in your life. I take risks now, I, t I, I do what I'm going to set out to do because if that's a door that's being opened, then I'm going to walk through it and do it, regardless of what people think. I'm not letting anybody ride my Ferris wheel happen since December of 2007. If I go through the wrong door this time, after having asked the Lord to, be, to lead me, guide me, and direct me each day, then if I go through the wrong door, He'll close the door down the hallway and open this one. So I can't make a bad decision, neither can you. I hope that you uh, will learn something from this lesson, something from the Bible today, and that you will click on the link below, the salvation link, that you will discover that going through um, fear and going through these uh, decisions that you will be making all throughout your life, you don't have to worry about what other people think. 
You only really have to be concerned with how the Lord is guiding you and leading you and directing you. And if you ask Him to, He's going to do that. I'll see you guys next week. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and don't let anybody ride your Ferris wheel to the top or the bottom. See you later.